Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting live on July 18th, 2023, from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Today, we're going to take another look at the major changes that are happening at New College of Florida. It's a school in Sarasota. There have been two major revelations in the last week or so, and we'll get to both of them and much more this hour. One of those is that New College has lost one third of its total faculty for all or part of the upcoming academic year. And the other is that returning students received emails from New College telling them that their housing assignments had been changed to accommodate incoming record numbers of incoming student athletes and freshmen, first year students. And our guests will talk about how both of those changes and many others are impacting them at New College of Florida. I'd like to hear what our listeners have to say as well. So you can email me at dj at wmnf.org. You can also text 813-433-0885. And you can give us a call at 813-239-9663. Joining us now are Hannah Homer, the president, uh, the parent that is, of a new college student who is considering transferring. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Hannah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for joining us all the way from Pennsylvania. And also we have a student who recently made the decision to transfer out of New College to another school out of state, Basil Pursley. So welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Basil. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I'm glad that both of you could join us. So Basil, let's start with you. We've been hearing a lot about the changes to New College this year. So let's back up a little bit. What made you choose to go to New College in the first place? And what was it like before those changes? Um, well, I originally, uh, I've wanted to go to new college since I was eight years old, uh, when a friend of mine's mom was telling me about like how great it was just because I said like, I want to be a marine biologist as a kid that ended up changing. But initially, you know, I had a parent tell me like, this is where I went to school and this is such a fantastic place. And then you know, as I went through middle school and high school, I, you know, did more research on my own and realized like, wow, this really is like an awesome institution for a lot of different things. And I really think it could be a launching point for my life. Um, I started in fall 2021. Um, so while the pandemic was still like really raging on, but I had taken a gap year to like sort of, uh, so that I could take classes in person. Um, and I just had an amazing experience. I fell in love with the community. I made uh, friends and was able to socialize for the first time since like the pandemic and that year. Um, and I just had amazing professors um, that have just really been influential in like figuring out my passion, which I have really found is radio and journalism. So <laughs> very happy to be here. Um, and yeah, it just, it, it, it was such an amazing experience to just have professors who really, you know, were engaged with me on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, level and wanted to see me succeed and find that passion. And one of the things that when people would think about new college, a couple of the things would come up, at least, you know, this is what I would think of. And, and this is what people would tell me that they thought of is one thing about new college is that there were no grades and that also that you could kind of patch together whatever kind of study concentration you wanted rather than having uh, cookie cutter uh, majors. So tell us about what, what, how, what, how those two things manifested in your academic career early on at new college. Yeah, so uh, not having grades was definitely a big pro for me um, that like really helped me decide um, to go there in the first place. Um, I have always, you know, been a bit of a perfectionist. And so I felt like having, you know, actual narrative evaluations, the actual feedback from professor professors was always way more useful than a number or a letter grade that just sort of made me, you know, sit there and wonder what did I do wrong? What could I have done better? Um, and yeah, so that has, it's honestly been more encouraging to get narrative evaluations from professors where it says like, hey, you 
were very engaged at the beginning of class, but I saw that you kind of, you know, stopped being as engaged at the end. I would have loved to see you talk more in class. You had a lot of useful insights um, or things like that. Like it was just very encouraging to see like, okay, I did do well on these things, but here's where I can do better in my next semester. Um, in terms of like creating your own path um, academically, I, um, I started out not really knowing what I was going to major in. Um, I just took whatever classes seemed interesting to me. Um, and so I ended up just having a lot of different experiences from different disciplines that really informed like, okay, these are the parts of that which I'm interested in. And so I want to you know, I want to uh, specify more in that. And um, yeah, so I ended up taking a uh, a class on newspaper writing, which also allowed me to write for the new college uh, student newspaper, The Catalyst. And I just ended up really loving that. Um, just kind of did it on a whim because I was like, you know what, why not try this? Well, let's turn now to Hannah. Hannah, your son is a fourth year student at New College. So why did he pick New College? And was his experience there before the changes similar to what we've been hearing from Basil? Yes. Um, thanks, Basil. It's your tough act to follow. <laughs> um, my son uh, has always very much been a self-directed learner. I'm a veterinary scientist and I would have to go look for my textbooks in his, you know, under the bed kind of thing. Um, we did not know anything about New College of Florida. Uh, the whole family, including his older sister, aunts, parents, all had gone to Swarthmore College and we lived not far from there. So that was on the list, but we really knew that he had different interests maybe. Um, he's also neurodivergent and was maybe looking for a different kind of community. Uh, we hired a friend who is a professional college, you know, um, counselor, and they came up with a list together. And one of the schools was New College of Florida. He went to visit and he just loved it. He'd been to Sarasota. He'd done like a science camp thing in middle school at the Moat Marine Lab. Um, so he already had a very, you know, fondness for the area. He loves the water. Uh, and he just loved that it was self-directed, no grades, um, very small student to faculty ratio. He's always loved, you know, having conversations with adults and teachers. So he looked forward to that. And he felt like there were um, students there that he would be comfortable with. And, you know, he was seeing people like him. He liked that you could wear whatever you wanted to the commencement ceremony. You could walk around barefoot if you wanted to. You you know you could have long hair or colors or whatever you want, and people aren't going to give you a hard time. Um, so he felt like he would be at home there. That's the voice of Hannah Homer, a parent of a new college student, and we'll find out later. This this student is considering transferring from new college, hasn't made up their mind yet, and we also are hearing from Basil Persley who is a student who recently made the decision to transfer out of New College to another school out of state. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're coming to you from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And I'd like to hear from our listeners as well. DJ at WMNF.org is how you can email us. I'll read emails in a little bit. Text 813-433-0885. Or if you'd like to phone in, it's 813-239-9663. And we're coming to you live on July 18th from the studios of WMNF Tampa. So Hannah, let me, uh, and and Basil, all of this, you're, you're kind of describing an idyllic situation for a student. The, both of the, your, both Hannah, your son and Basil, you sounded like you are having a great time at New College. It was a perfect fit for academic learning and social institution. But all this started to change in early January of this year when Governor DeSantis announced he was appointing several new conservative trustees and planning to change the whole feel of the school. And one of the first changes was the board of trustees fired the former president and put in interim president Richard Corcoran and it gave him a $699,000 salary. So I'll first ask Hannah, what uh, were you starting to think 
about it then that real changes were happening at your son's school? Oh, yes, um, absolutely. My being in academia, um, more for professional school than undergraduate, um, I had a friend who was a middle states commissioner, and he had spent time in my lab, and we had talked a lot about what he did as a commissioner. So he was one of the first people that I called. I'm like, you know, what can we do? This seems like there are accreditation violations. And um, so I also found my way to our uh, new college parent advocacy group. And uh, I ended up being the person that, you know, looked into the accreditation issues. And what really, I mean, it seems like ages ago now, but re what really struck me is there's supposed to be guardrails in place to slow change. I remember asking um, when my son was considering new college, I'm like, well, I'm not completely happy with the political environment uh, and it's a public college. Do we have concerns about that? And the conclusion at the time was, yes, things can change. It's a public school. Obviously the administration can do what they want, but the accreditation process should slow that down. So there shouldn't be a huge disruption and there shouldn't be chaos. And what we're seeing is that there has not been any guardrails enforced. And therefore what we have is chaos, you know, simply that's where we ended up. Um, Basil, would you agree with Hannah that early on, right soon after the board of new board of trustees took over, that there were changes that were actually appearing on the ground there at New College? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the <laughs> the earliest changes were social changes of just like you know we on January sixth of this year, you know, we hear about this happening, and you know suddenly a bunch of us are just like what does this mean? We really didn't know what it meant or what it looked like. And so uh, everyone was just really stressed. There were a significant amount of people studying abroad for that month for our independent study period, um, which is the entire month of January. And including the student body president was out of the country. And so I just remember everyone was just trying to like scrape together, like, what can we do? do to help this and what are we even fighting against because we had no idea what goals were like what was going to happen um and so I felt like you know the whole energy on campus and like student morale was the first thing to really just kind of like you know people were passionate but people were also like getting burnt out very quickly I know I ended up just getting burnt out from seeing and hearing about all of this and just spent like a week, like no phone, no laptop in my dorm, just kind of sitting there, like watching Netflix and just like, I'm not thinking about this right now. I just can't do this anymore. Um, and I wasn't considering transferring then because I just, I also kind of figured like they can't change things that quickly. They can't make it that bad that quickly. And so, um, I just didn't think like it would be worth it for me to transfer, especially because, you know, with the no grade system, it's not that easy to transfer out credits. And so it just didn't make sense at the time for me to transfer. It didn't seem like the best option. And then, of course, seven months later, it definitely is so much has changed that, that it ways in the other direction that it's just not worth it to go back and try to make that work anymore. And we'll be talking about the intervening seven months and what has happened and what's helped you to, to formulate your mind to change to actually make it that transfer. We'll be doing talking about that throughout this hour. I just want to remind people that that's the voice of Basil Pursley, a student who recently made the decision to transfer out of new college to another school out of state and we're also speaking with Hannah Homer, who's the parent of a new college student who's considering transferring. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canaan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Some of the next big changes that, that happened right after Richard Corcoran became interim president was that New College's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Department was dissolved, and its dean of diversity was fired. So some people might argue 
that changes like that to kind of non-academic departments might not have very much impact on students, uh, whether it's their academics or their life on campus. But let me ask you, Basil, what kind of impact did losing that DEI department have on your life? Well, I, again, I think it was mostly morale, honestly. Uh, it just felt like the protections that were in place. Um, I, I identify as transgender. So this part is like important to me of just, you know, having something in place to make sure that my needs as someone who is actively transitioning are met and make sure, you know, I am respected in the classroom and in the social environment. And I had never had a problem with that at New College. I had always had them very respectful, very easy to change, like things like my email or make sure, you know, professors knew my actual name. Um, and, you know, I just, as soon as that was announced, I very much, you know, realized like they're probably just gonna not do that anymore like that is all probably going to go to the wayside because there's no one advocating for me anymore uh there's no staff advocating for me anymore and so um yeah it just definitely for me and like other people it affected in different ways for uh like students of color and you know religious minorities like it definitely it affected us all in different ways um and yeah i guess for me it just was like worrying that like i'm no longer going to really feel safe and respected on campus because there's no one there to make sure that that's happening and there's no one i can really go to about that and around that same time, a librarian at New College who identifies as LGBTQ was fired from their job as well. Um, and I don't know if, if um, Hannah, if your son had any kind of, um, if, if any of these issues, if these concerns or things that were happening had any impact on your son's academic career around that time. Yeah, um, more so the librarian, but I just want to mention because it's it's hard to keep track of everything that these firings were happening in a basically a fire hose to the face of bad information and bad news and very little community like no positive communication, no explanations from administration. Um, when the DEI officer was fired, the Board of Trustees had agreed that the position should be shifted to other open positions on campus. And then very abruptly, in a very cruel manner, that person was called into the president's office, fired, dismissed. And the same thing happened to the, the head librarian. Um, she has, um, her expertise is in STEM, uh, information technology, and my son is a STEM major, uh, just starting his thesis project, and is supposed to work on the in the introductory, you know, background material over the summer. So that resource was removed. Like, luckily, I could help him since I'm a scientist. But um, that librarian was fired three weeks before the end of term while students were working on their end of term papers and thesis projects. So it was, it, it came across quite as a, like a very deliberate, cruel thing, both to the person fired and to the students to say, we're just gonna yank this support out from under you, you don't matter. Um, and it's just one of many situations where we felt like faculty and students were being almost, you know, directly told that they don't matter and they're not important. Now, the other, in, the other instance being uh, the April 26th Board of Trustees meeting when the faculty were denied tenure. Uh, three of those faculty, it was five faculty, three were STEM fields, two were my son's chemistry professors. He had done one of those independent study projects with one of them, adored that professor, and both, adored both of them, and they were just 
you know, no reason given. They're just denied tenure. And then spin was put on it to try to say, oh, they were going up for early tenure, which was just nonsense. So uh, I want to remind people that we're speaking with Hannah Homer, who is the parent of a new college student who is considering transferring, and Basil Persley, a student who recently made the decision to transfer out of new college to another school out of state. And you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. And on that subject of these professors being denied tenure, including professors that your, your son was working with, um, you know, can you comment on the importance of tenure at a small college like New College? I'm sure that the professors aren't getting paid um, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars every year. They're they're there because they like to teach students, I, I assume, if it's anything like my college experience. So wh what would you say about um, some people might say, hey, no big deal. They were just denied tenure. Um, but what is the importance of tenure? Sure. Um... Tenure is important for giving these faculty some stability. Uh, they've often, especially the ones that are in STEM science fields, have they've done their graduate program. They've done often two postdocs. They've had to move. They may have done multiple faculty positions before they got the chance to have a um, tenure track position. And it's giving them some stability that they are um, hired long-term instead of having a year-to-year -year contract or a three-year contract or whatever their arrangement is. Um, so that's very important uh, for them, especially, you know, they have families, they may have partners and spouses that also have jobs. So it's really disruptive to have to move because you're, you know, lost, your position was not renewed, uh, as well as um, scientists, are establishing research programs and they, you know, they have laboratories, they have field work, they have teams of people. So it's not even just them. They're not picking up their books and leaving. They're, you know, trying to figure out how many of their people will move with them or whether they're going to just have to start from scratch. Uh, they're losing access to shared facilities and equipment for research, for example, uh, as well. So, um, and I guess also want to point out that the tenured professors are not exempt from review. They can be fired. They have, uh, depending on the institution, they have you know, a certain period of time reviews that happen. They are getting you know, teaching review con you know, information from surveys of students. They're getting feedback on what they're doing with the research. So they're not just Oh yeah, they can go do whatever they want, and they're going to, you know, go down a path that nobody wants. That's just not reality. Let's bring Basil into this. Basil, did what was your reaction when those, when the board of trustees of the new college, which were mostly new appointees, denied tenure to these faculty members? I remember the biggest I I didn't per I didn't know any of the professors that were denied tenure. Um it was nevertheless very heartbreaking to hear about, but I think from that meeting in particular my biggest reaction was when uh Professor Lipinski the uh uh the the faculty representative on the board of trustees uh, walked out of the meeting and said he was going to uh, resign, that I was, I, my car had broken down, so I already wasn't having a good day, and I was not on campus and not actively watching, but I got a text from a friend telling me, and then later I watched it, and it was just like, so, <laughs> it was so heartbreaking. Uh, I had talked to uh, Matt, like, several times. He was a fantastic professor. Um, he was my partner's uh, ad faculty advisor. Um, and it just like, after that, I was like, you know, our one of our biggest advocates on the board of trustees is, you know, leaving, he's going. And, you know, someone who's been uh, very influential in the computer science department actually created the computer science department at new college is 
leaving. And so it just was like, man, this whole department could actually fall apart because of this. This whole department could be gone. And same with the professors who were denied tenure because New College is such a small school. Having just one professor leave a department means that you're missing out on a whole branch of that uh, department that like it can't be easily refilled. Um, and so you know, it just meant that like in chemistry and biology, I don't know, I don't remember exactly what those professors were teaching, but it just meant that students in those fields now had to consider, man, this like particular field of study that I wanted to do, that might not be an option anymore because I don't have a professor to actually help me through this. Um, so it was definitely like a very it was, it was a very discouraging meeting. It was a very, like, just realizing, you know, there might not be people here to help me through my thesis project. Um, yeah, so just, yeah. <laughs> and Herald Tribune writer Stephen Walker tweeted yesterday that New College of Florida has lost 36 faculty for part or all of the upcoming academic year that represents more than a third of total faculty. And he was quoting there the provost Brad Thiessen at yesterday's Board of Trustees Committee meeting. New College of Florida, on the other hand, has hired 15 new faculty with about 14 more negotiating or mulling offers. It just sounds you know, like to me as an observer looking from the outside with a third gone and almost that number potentially coming in new, there's so much turnover. Will it be the same kind of institution next year as it was a year ago. I don't know, Basil, your thoughts. Yeah, so the 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 turnover and people leaving is one of the biggest reasons why I decided to transfer because I mean, I I was going to uh try to do my thesis this year. Um I, you know, I this is technically my fourth year of college can um if I'm counting my dual enrollment, but I initially wanted to stay a total of four years at New College and really get that experience and, you know, explore my interests. But with everything going on, I had, you know, made the decision, okay, I'll just do my thesis. And I found out uh, in the summer months that <laughs> in June that uh, the professor that was supposed to be my uh my faculty sponsor for my thesis had left and gone to a different university and got a great job offer there and very happy for her. But it was like immediately just like heart drop. Like I felt so sick and anxious and like I just no longer felt like I was going to have someone there that would help me you know, work on my thesis project and make sure I met all the requirements and actually graduate by the end of the next year. Um, and especially like, you know, even if they are filling these positions with good professors, um, like I just haven't had the time to develop any relationships with them. So people like me who are started trying to do their thesis project and looking for people to help them, and the only people who might be there are new professors who they haven't had any time to develop a relationship with or don't understand the new college system in its fullest yet because they haven't been there. That just sounds very troubling and like just not a very good experience for your senior thesis project that is supposed to be the capstone on your, you know, college experience. So it, it just didn't feel right anymore. That's the voice of Basil Pursley, who is a student at, who recently made the decision to transfer out of New College and go to another school out of state. We also have with us Hannah Homer, the parent of a New College student who is considering transferring. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canaan coming to you from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And I want to transition this uh, conversation right now for a few minutes to housing. The Sarasota Herald Tribune reported recently about a letter that was sent to returning students that they were going to lose their promised housing and new, instead new students and student athletes would get that preferred housing. So Basil, did you get that letter? 
So I, <laughs> the funny thing about the letter is it came a little too late. Honestly, I did. I heard about the housing problem from other students who figured it out on their own um, on the student email forum that any like students can send messages to each other or emails to each other. You know, someone posted like, hey, everyone in Dorton Gold needs to check their housing because they might not be in Dorton Gold anymore. Um, very worrying to hear this from a student first, not the school. Um, but I go and check the housing profile and Lo and behold, uh, I don't have a housing placement. I was supposed to be um, in the apartment style housing known as uh, Dorton Gold um, and on the first floor um, because I have mobility issues um, and I needed to be in one of those dorms because they have a kitchen, which I need because I can't eat at the dining hall. Uh, I just have too many dietary restrictions, so I have to cook for myself. Um, and so suddenly that housing placement was gone and they also, you know, did not say where they were going to put me instead. So in a panic, I emailed, um, housing, anyone I can think of in housing, the accommodations office, anyone I can think of in that office and just like ask like, Hey, I need this housing. I need to be in Dort or Gold. What can I do to make sure this has, you know, this is okay and that I'm in that placement? You know, these are my accommodations. If I need to write new letters, I will. I can talk to my doctor. Um, and they didn't get back to me. They did not respond to me. Um, and then, you know, a few days later, we do get an email saying, you know, we're putting the new student athletes in Dorton Gold. We'll try to keep as many housing placements as possible, but upperclassmen will be moved into the letter dorms and the uh, and pay, which are basically dorms mainly for first and second years. Um, so, yeah, it was a very, it was a very bad experience and a very panicked few days, but it really only took me like 24 hours after finding out about that housing placement issue to realize it was no longer worth it for me to stay at new college. I was just done. That was, that was, that was the last straw. That was the nail in the coffin. I just did not feel like jumping through these hoops that should not have been there for me to jump through in the first place. Like this just shouldn't have happened. Um, and I just decided I didn't care if they tried to fix it, if they like fixed it or not, because it simply just should not have been a problem in the first place. And Hannah, let me ask you, have you, did your son get a letter or find out um, if, if that his housing had been uh, switched without, you know, without much warning? Yeah, I actually told him to check because the parents group had received, you know, a screenshot from, you know, as parents, we're not um, receiving the emails, they're adults, so they're getting the communications directly, um, and I had sent it to him, and he checked. He was supposed to be in gold, which in a apartment-style housing, he's starting his thesis, so he really needs the privacy to, to work on that, but at the same time, that environment was nice because it's it's sweet, so you still have some social interaction with your friends and roommates, but then you can shut your door and get your work done. Um, and this is also likely to be a last straw type situation. I don't know, maybe that was the intent. Maybe they are trying to, it certainly seems given the minimal communication we've had that all of these you know, next terrible things are just ways to try to force out the current students. And, you know, at some point you create enough chaos that, you know, congratulations, it worked, we're leaving. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, the other thing that was discussed yesterday and has been discussed is that parts of pay dorm are closed because of mold. Uh, and beyond that, the whole building's connected by the HVAC system. So even doing some remediation in part of the dorm is not necessarily removing a mold problem. Um, my son was in pay for his second year and it was fine, the part he was in, um, but that that would be a very small room to be 
in as a double or triple and try to work on a thesis project at the same time. Um, and I had one other thing about the faculty the, to keep in mind is that it's not only eliminating professors that students need for their thesis projects, but prerequisite classes that they need for things like pre-med or you know, other um, areas of concentration majors um, that they're losing. That's the voice of Hannah Homer, the parent of a new college student who is considering transferring from new college. We're also hearing from Basil Persley, a student who recently made the decision to transfer out of new college and go to another school out of state. And you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. So we 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 covered a lot of ground there about the housing and we threw a lot around a lot of names. And so just to kind of um, refresh people's memory for if you're not familiar with the housing there, we have the um, what Basil referred to as Dort and Gold, which are Dort and Goldstein buildings. They're apartment type housing for mostly for upper class uh, students, uh, higher students, third and fourth year students usually. And then, then uh, Hannah referred to the pay buildings, which is the architect pay. Uh, and these are older buildings and it sounds like smaller rooms. And now there's this mold problem that we're learning about. For example, Stephen Walker of the Sarasota Herald Tribune reported this morning that New College of Florida trustees convened yesterday for a meeting to discuss the issues of housing and the, they are now discussing using hotel rooms from a nearby Hilton on Tamiami Trail in Sarasota to accommodate a 150 bed shortfall as several student housing buildings are shut down due to renovations and mold issues that make some buildings uninhabitable. Uh, that doesn't sound like a very conducive environment for, for people who are trying to finish their educations. They thought they had an apartment style building uh, where they would have roommates, suite mates, I guess you'd call it, with uh, shared accommodations. But now they're finding that their their housing is instead in dorms that um, might have mold issues. I don't know, Hannah. Uh, what is your son telling you about all of these uh, all of these things that are coming at him? I like again. I think um, it's definitely pushing him towards transfer. Um, it was not an easy decision. He's still not there yet. Um, but the idea of being in a double or triple, or being in who knows? I guess the hotel is the one that's north of USF. I'm not sure. I don't even know. Being out of state, I don't really have a sense of where it would be. Um, I mean, part of his daily activity was walking from where the dorms are down to the bay and back as you know his exercise and his mental you know daily activity would do and instead if you're in the hotel you like you have to get a shuttle bus it said we'll have hourly shuttle buses run by the hotel they're not even having the college provide that transportation it's like yeah just sure that, that'll be taken care of um there was even mention that like, oh, it's okay. They'll get continental breakfast there. <laughs> so um, that I just, I don't even know how to respond to something like that. It's just so ridiculous. And at the same time, we're seeing all the athletes being added. Um, they're showing up on Twitter, for example, with their, you know, saying that they're coming. They're almost exclusively male. I don't understand how that's not, affirmative action that they're targeting the specific population they're bending over backwards they're giving them free laptops and special um, scholarships and special housing that's to me that's you know you're targeting an identity group you're targeting these students and making things nice for them and ignoring the rest of the students um, I don't understand why you would uh, increase enrollment without doing feasibility studies and figure out what your housing situation is and what needs to be fixed first. Um, like, why would you bring the students without figuring out the infrastructure first? That's just, uh, that just makes no sense to me at all. Uh, it just seems like incompetence. And Basil, Hannah brought up the student athletes and the new students who are coming in who are, are joining these sports programs. So tell us a little bit about what the New College of Florida was like and maybe its attitude towards student athletes and how important it is on New, new College's campus 
a year ago, let's say, compared to others, you know, we might be familiar with how it might be viewed at FSU or at UF or something like that. Uh, but there has been this big push to in, initiate sh some sports there at New College, including changing the school's mascot. It was the null set. So I don't know if you want to, here's your time to, to just tell us what's the attitude towards sports and, and student athletes there at, at New College? Yeah, I mean, so before all this happened, uh, you know, I think contrary to popular belief, we did have sports. Uh, people, you know, it was mostly recreational. I think there were some teams that would go and do um, competitive things sometimes. Um, but, you know, everything was, you know, really student driven um, you know, just deciding like, hey, I want to start playing basketball and then starting a basketball team. Um, everything has always been co-ed. Um, you know, it's just been really, you know, student driven recreational activity. Um, and uh, so the this sort of attitude towards it has really just been more lax. It's just kind of it's more of a casual thing. Um, and, you know, the the whole the the athletic thing coming on really feels like a massive disrespect towards the culture that New College has had around athletics and recreational activity, which has been more like, you know, this is just, you know, something to do to decompress. I don't think anyone uh has like any ill will against like uh, a sports team, but hearing that they're not going to be co-ed and that they are specifically bringing in new students to join these teams um, instead of, you know, allowing older students to, you know, participate or anything like that. Um, and that they're basically just kind of creating this whole separate program at the school for athletic students versus the older students. It's really just like a complete divide between these demographics. And they certainly seem to want it that way um, since they are trying to move, um, you know, upperclassmen off campus, um, which uh, is very concerning to me. Uh, like just if, if I had to live off campus on a hotel, I just don't think it would accommodate what I need medically in terms of like mobility and everything. And then, you know, there will be students there without cars uh, who have to wait for a shuttle if they want to go to campus or, you know, it's just, I feel like it's going to completely kill student life because you're not going to want to go all the way back over to the school for a club, like after you have just got done, like, you know, studying for several hours, just like, okay, there's no, you know, that's a lot of effort to go back over there or, you know, going to the parties on campus, the, which are called walls and coups. Like, I just don't think, you know, without people who are there to hold that tradition on campus, it's just going to, slowly disappear um, because they're just making it harder and harder for upperclassmen to participate. Our guest is Basil Persley, a student who recently made the decision to transfer out of New College to another school out of state. We're also speaking with Hannah Homer, the, the parent of a New College student who is considering transferring. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa, we're live on July 18th, and I'd like to hear what you think about this situation. You can email dj at wmnf.org. You can text 813-433-0885, or you can phone in at 813-239-9663. Let me read this email that came in from Bubba, and he says, I'm a new college alum, and it's shameful that the sadist is how he puts it, is using such an excellent school as his political pawn. And then maybe um, maybe I can have Hannah comments kind of on on uh, what Bubba's getting at in the next part of his question or his his statement here. He says, "Who slipped a rufo in my college?" And he's referring here to one of the new uh, members of the board of trustees. Hannah, do you have anything that you uh, can can add on to the top of that email from Bubba? 
Yeah, I think he's he's referring to board of trustee members, and there's there's more than one that has said very hostile things about current students and faculty and parents even. Um, surprisingly enough, I don't know why they would bother, but they have. Um, it's definitely contributed to the hostile environment to have people that are supposed to be in a fiduciary role where they are, you know, taking into consideration the welfare of their stakeholders to be saying terrible things on social media or in person or on blogs. Um, it's the whole, I don't know, the whole, this is a, you know, an anti-woke thing that we have to fix public education. I've been in higher education for my whole career. And if anything, I've been exposed to more points of view because at an R1 research institution, you work with people from China and Russia and Iran and, you know, Germany, and, you know, you're not, you're not isolated at all. So I just don't, that point of view, um, using it to weaponize changes that then limit ideology to a specific point of view um, is the same thing that's happened to K through 12 public education where they're claiming to be protecting students and education, but at the same time they're imposing their will. And that's what it feels like. And perhaps that's maybe best seen recently in when this month, the new College of Florida Board of Trustees approved requesting $2 million from the state legislature to set up what they're calling a Freedom Institute. And the institute is intended to get rid of what they call cancel culture in higher education. So Hannah, this goes to that point you just made about a diversity of viewpoints. Of course, they're saying they, they want students uh, uh, exposed to a diversity of viewpoints. But kind of if you read between the lines, it almost sounds like they're they're just trying to maybe push one one set of, of viewpoints. Yeah, I would refer people to what happened at commencement as a good example of what will happen. OK, help me out. Remind me. I, so I know that there that was, a... was um, Scott Atlas was in the invited speaker. There was zero input from faculty or students. That speaker was just picked and they have a very controversial anti-science perspective on the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and the viewpoints that have been rejected by the medical healthcare epidemiology, you know, everybody. Um, so it's using free speech to reject uh, expert opinions. And to say, well, it's just showing the other side when the other side is, you know, not based in fact. So let me read this. And, the, and the commencement was, you know, there was protests that happened at commencement because people weren't happy with having that fo foisted on them. And another thing that students did besides just protest that Scott Atlas is they also held their own alternative graduation uh, Basil, did, were you part of either of those, and and uh, or what can you say about how the students uh, reacted to the speaker at the official graduation? I had uh, the pleasure of being invited to the alternative uh, commencement. Um, it was I I will speak on that first. <laughs> um, uh, it was a wonderful and just purely joyous experience. It felt like just you know, stepping out of everything that had transpired from that semester and, you know, just being in a completely safe space in, you know, just sort of like remembering what that new college I loved uh, was and getting to see, you know, people I, <laughs> I really respect and care about graduate and just have a good, like a fully good graduation experience that they really deserved was fantastic. Um, and honestly, just seeing all of like my professors, like just, you know, I, they all were like taking pictures together and talking and it just felt like a lot more normal. Like everyone could let their guard down a little 
Uh, we had live music and everyone got to walk across the stage. And uh, that librarian that you mentioned earlier that was fired was uh, there and she gave a speech and we had a speech from a civil rights leader. Um, and it was just a, a fantastic experience of just joy and kind of just like forgetting everything else for like a couple of hours. And I'm really glad that the the graduating students got that and that, you know, just that everyone got to participate in that. Um, the commencement that the college put on, a uh, completely different atmosphere. Um, a lot of graduating students said before the graduation that like, hey, we don't want people to be protesting this. This is our day. Please don't yell. Please don't be you know, disruptive, just be quiet. Um, but of course, when you bring in someone that polarizing, it's kind of hard to stop people from yelling. Um, there were there were a lot of onlookers, people in camp chairs, people sitting up in the tree because it's held outside. So people sitting in a tree watching. Um, and yeah, there were a lot of people just like yelling throughout uh scott atlas's speech at i think you know at some point in it people just started chanting wrap it up wrap it up um and yeah <laughs> so that experience was just kind of like it it just felt mundane at that point it was just like god this is just everything that we've been experiencing every day here uh seriously just wrap it up let's be done with this and we have, speaking of wrapping up, we have only a couple of minutes left. And one of the things I wanted to ask you, Basil, before we are, are finished here, is I wanted to find out from you, when you made this decision that you were going to transfer from New College, you kind of made a public announcement on Twitter, and then I imagine you got some reaction. So tell us about what the reaction was when people when heard this heartfelt um, thing that you were telling them about that you were leaving the place you loved and you were going somewhere else? Honestly, I, I made the tweet just sort of venting in a way. I got up that morning, you know, after making my deposit to the place I'm transferring to and, you know, still very sad. And so I, I made that tweet and I wasn't expecting much, but I, the reaction has been so positive. Uh, like professors have reached out to me from their Twitter account saying like, hey, Basil, I'm really sad to see you leave. But if there's anything I can do to help or, you know, congratulating me on making this decision and alums from the college, like telling me like this is the right decision. And, you know, friends I've had saying like this is the right decision, uh, other people reaching out to me and saying like I'm thinking of transferring and this, you know, made me feel more comfortable in doing so. And it just felt very reaffirming and put me a lot at peace with the fact that like, yeah, this this is the right decision for me to make. I do need to get out of this situation and I was very glad to see that the people I was worried who would maybe be resentful towards me for that or others for that were very much like, you know, had a lot of empathy for the situation that all of us have been put in. Um, and everyone just has to make their own decision based on what they want to do. And I have a lot of respect for the people who are sticking it out. Um, and I have a lot of respect for the other people like myself who are transferring. I'm afraid that's all the time we have, but I want to thank you so much, both of you, for coming on Tuesday Cafe, Hannah and Basil. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I'm really glad to have been able to talk to you. And Hannah Homer is the parent of a new college student who is considering transferring. Basil Pursley is a student who recently made the decision to transfer out of new college to another school out of state. And if you missed this interview, you can watch it beginning this afternoon on our website, WMNF.org. Tuesday Cafe also airs on TBAE. I want to thank our phone screener, John Dunn. And you've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, News and Public Affairs Director at WMNF Tampa. During this time slot tomorrow, Shelly Reback will host Midpoint to continue the conversation about education, including discussion of an African-American African education task force. Coming up next is Wavemakers. Tom will talk about transportation challenges, 
The city of Tampa is releasing its mobility plan, and we'll hear from Pinellas County as well. This has been Tuesday Cafe coming to you from WMNF Tampa.